then. Uh, brilliant. Well, today we are joined by Tim Mitchell. Thank you so much for being with us, Tim. Um, no it's wonderful of you to give your time. And uh, I wonder if we could just start off with a little bit about you, um, your background, and I mean, the route that you took to where you are now, really. Okay. Um, I started, um, I hated school. I loathed school. I hated education. Uh, and I was actually going to go in the Navy, bizarrely. <clears throat> um, uh, and I, I, as I couldn't go in and be in charge of the Navy, I didn't want to do that. So I went into the theatre instead. Um, uh, and um, didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to like shows, but I didn't know how to get about it. So I walked into the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff and asked if they had any jobs. And um, in those days, uh, in the days of Margaret Thatcher and recession, um, I, they had things called work, work experience program. So it was 25 quid a week. So I went in, had an interview with the technical director, the then um, Peter Woodham, who was a lovely gentleman, and they offered me the job. And uh, they, on the proviso that they never employed people on the work exploit, there were never any jobs available. Um, to go on after it was a six month thing end of story at the end of six months if you liked and I went well it's six months work I had nothing else to do mm -hmm. I'd been for jobs as panel beater and sprayer in car doing car re repaints and things but um, uh, I, I didn't ever get them anyway so um, I said well it's six months work happy days I'll do that for 25 pounds a week um, and they then offered me a job um, after saying they wouldn't as an apprentice electrician and they, as it was a university theatre, they then sent me away to one day a week to become an electrician, um, which was great. And then three years later, uh, I was the grand age of 20. I was running the lighting department and uh, a BFI film theatre, uh, and two theatres and six electricians. Uh, then the company got, I always wanted to light shows. They were, it was touring house mainly. Then they got the Sherman Theatre Company in 1985. And I said, I'll like your shows. And they went, bugger off. You can't <laughs> like the shows. 20 years old. Well, I've even tried to grow a beard, which I couldn't grow a beard. Uh, and, um, uh, and then I, they gave me co-lights to light. So um, two wonderful gentlemen, um, one of which was John Waterhouse, who was the head of lighting at Welsh National Opera. I used to like shows at the Sherman Theatre Company. Um, and there was Peter Mumford who used to come and do sets, costumes and lighting. And, and, and I didn't like with Peter, but Peter and I became, I've known him since I was 17. So we became uh, good chums and certainly are still good chums over the years. And then um, uh, John was head of uh, the course of Bristol Ovic Theatre School. And then another chap called John Williams, who's still my great friend, <clears throat> Sadly, John Waterhouse died many years ago, but John Williams was the head of lighting at Bristol Old Vic and a brilliant, a brilliant lighting designer. And still is lighting, lights the Hong Kong waterfront. He's, um, uh, he was, until very recently, the, um, the Dean of Technical Performing Arts at the Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts. Ah. But basically, I lit a couple of shows and they said to her, they said to the management he can like shows I'm like, why why are you why are you getting us in because they used to sit in the back of the auditorium and that's how I started from there um I being 20 and very gobby and very cocky um and very long hair um, <laughs> um and um uh uh I went to Bristol Old Vic um because I couldn't get a job as chief as anywhere else I was 21 Nobody would employ me. They'd, they'd look at me, yeah, you've done this, but you're 21. So, um, and I lit most of the company shows, went to Bristol Old Vic as deputy chief um, and spent the first three months lying on my back, rewiring Staple Hill, their stalls, drilling into concrete because I was a qualified electrician. Um, and I'm saying, oh, why am I doing this? As I only want to like shows. I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, um, um, I got the job at Bristol because John Williams left to go to Hong Kong and John said whatever you do don't tell Tim who was the chief that you want to like shows T tell him you're an electrician and I did and hence rewiring things around the around, around Bristol essentially um, and then 
my first opportunity to light a show was with Phila Lloyd. So I, cause Phila was associate there. And then I ended up lighting all Phila shows at Bristol Old Vic. Uh, Anthony Ward was the set designer. And I was about 23 then. And Anthony said, have you got an agent? And I went, uh, what's an agent? I have no <laughs> idea. Yeah, lighting shows. I just turn up, make it go pink, and go home again. Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, um, uh, uh, his his agent at the time, Kate Luthwaite, had seen a lot of my work, and she said, "I would like to represent you." I, okay, thank you very much. That's very good. And then strange things happened, like um, the BBC uh, came to see. Um, uh, a streetcar named Desire that I that I'd lit had wonderful reviews and they went we're doing a, a Christmas musical at Plymouth Theatre Royal and we want a lighting designer would you like to light it <laughs> yeah why not <laughs> hey <laughs> you know <laughs> so I, I ended up going to Plymouth and it was shown on Boxing Day um, uh, and it was about PG Woodhouse um, uh, they had a great scheme for it to go in the West End, but clearly it wasn't that good. Uh, anyway, uh, so I did that. And then I went from there to Brith to Birmingham Repertory Theatre as head of lighting. When I went to Birmingham Rep, um, the production manager who I knew asked me to apply for it. I wandered in. They offered me the job and being 25 and cocky, I said, yeah, but I'm in Bristol and I'm the Dep and I could freelance. I get to like the shows. I don't have to do shows. I just, I'm just like the deputy chief, but actually the resident lighting designer. So you're not offering me any shows. Are you certainly not offering me, let me go do freelance work. And they let me rock my contract. <laughs> oh, wow. So I ended up uh, sort of lighting shows when it fitted in with the thing. And then, so I did that for five years till 95. Um, and lit majority of the company shows and did freelance work. And then in 95, the brilliant director, Bill Alexander, turned up, um, who was the associate <coughs> director, or was at, at the Royal Shakespeare Company, which is down the road, clearly from Birmingham. And he was there, and I ended up lighting Bill's shows, and we got on really well. Uh, I started working with lots of different designers. And then in 96, after about a year... No, no, Bill came night four. So a couple of years of Bill being there, 96, Bill said, we're making your job redundant. And I went, okay. Thought I was doing okay. And they made me resident lighting designer, which at the time was the only job in the country. And it was essentially a freelance post, but they would pay me a salary. Okay. And I could choose, I became part of the artistic team and I could choose whatever shows I wanted to light, Bill would come to me with the two other associates and we'd all talk about what shows they're planning, what would you like to light, what you don't want, how does that fit in with your freelance work? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh well, you know, I could do that. And then from there, I went to the Royal Shakespeare Company because down the road and because of Bill's connections and they used to come up and see me and I ended up working with Mike Attenborough and then working with Gregory Doran who's in the current artistic director and then they made me an associate artist and it's the usual thing in this industry that uh, one thing trips into another into another mm. i mean in some respects it's not um there's no clear career pathway i don't think uh, in some country like america you could be an associate we don't have that clear pathway here and I was fortunate at the time to be working in venues that were producing with good directors that seemed to recognise that I could light a show. Mm. Mm. And they were very generous. <clears throat> and I, so I've had no formal training um, up until recently when I, during the crisis, I've been retraining myself to do architectural interior lighting design. So, which I've just passed everybody, which would have been a massive disappointment if I hadn't. <laughs> I would have had the right royal pip if I had not. Dear Mr. Mitchell, you right royally balls this up. Thank you very much, slam. <laughs> but no, I passed that, so that's good. Um, only to amuse myself, really. I have no idea whether it's going to be any use. So anyway, uh, digression. Um, um, so, but, but, um, so Birmingham, I stayed there till 2000, um, I went, at which point uh, Bill had left and Jonathan Church was about to start. Jonathan came to me and said, Tim, we can't afford to keep you, but we'll offer you lots. I said, Jonathan, 
I've not lit a show here for about 15 months now. I think it's probably time I left. <laughs> it's a bit sad. Um, so then I, I, in 2000, I, I completely tied any thing. And then strangely, I, I know I worked with Jonathan and Bill and all those other people I've been working with. And then in 2009, I went back with Jonathan at, at Chichester when he made me an associate artist there as part of the creative team there. Mm -hmm. so I was there for till 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 Jonathan left in 2016, 15. Yeah. So so it's been um an interesting ride, to be yeah. honest, and a very lucky one. Um uh I've just been in the right place at the right time, generally with the right people. I mean, yeah. you know, the, uh, and I'm a chameleon. Um I I, I light uh, I think I said to you yesterday, I'm a lighting prostitute. So <laughs> to be honest, if you pay me a tenner, I'll come and light your toilet. I don't really <laughs> mind. We could do something fruity, you know. Um, so uh, I'm a lighting prostitute, you know. I, yeah. I, I, I like lighting. More importantly, I like the people generally in the industry. There's assholes in every industry. We always come across them. But on the whole, most people from top to bottom are facing in the same direction, which you can't say about a lot of other industries. No, that's very true. And do you think that um, you sort of touched on like creative associates there as a, as a thing, um, like at Chichester and stuff. Do you think that's the closest that we have now then to, to you know, resident light and sound, which like in my time, that's never been a thing. Yes. I mean, you see, when I, I, I'm old, as you pointed out to me again yesterday. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, uh, two words, <laughs> and they've got F's involved. Um, uh, um, yeah, when I first started, the role lighting designers, I mean, I worked with some brilliant people, Robert Ormbo, Pilbro, um, Bob Bryan, people like that, you know? The big companies and the West End had uh, lighting designers title you know michael northern on the poster you know all those people fred bentham all those people that were from the 50s and 60s who, be, who are our foundation and we should never forget that they were at the forefront of it um with two dozen pattern 23s you know so um uh, they 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 were doing jobs at the national and rsc and that whereas regional theater it's the chief electrician's role mm. Mm. And sadly, um, not because the chief attrition, the, 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 the technology has changed and made it more difficult because I think electricians now not only have to know about electrics, lighting, but also networking. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, the, the, the game has changed. But also we're getting less and less regional producing theatres producing. Where I live now, I live, I live between Stratford and Avon and, and, and Evesham. In a 50 mile radius here, I could probably walk into half a dozen producing theatres, Cheltenham, Worcester, Birmingham, Coventry, RSC, you know what I mean? There's Bristol. Um, when I went to Bristol, they just closed, they just closed the little theatre. They had three theatres running red. Mm. Mm. And it's a very good, so we, I, and the industry has changed enormously. And now the role of a lighting designer is lighting designer, electrician is electrician. Whereas when I first started and up into the mid nineties, the chief electrician did quite a lot of the lighting design and they would probably get two or three freelancers in and you, you know, you as the chief or the head of lighting, whatever your job title was, would like the shows. Mm, yeah. Um, so I mean, today, We've, we've called this session a sort of uh, a bit of a throwaway title, unpicking a script. Um, <laughs> and you, you yes. threatened that people would be baffled by your process. Well, um, I don't have to be baffled, but I'm sure they'd be confused. Uh, <laughs> um, so I wondered, like, if we look at the very beginning of that, um, you get sent a script about a project. What's, what's the first thing you do? Do you, do you skim it or do you go through Well, the first thing you do is obviously you get the phone call from your agent, hopefully, uh, saying you've been, you've been um, availability checked and then you get the job. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, uh, uh, I think we briefly touched it. I mean, do you accept or do you decline a job? That's a tricky one at the inception. Do you know what I mean? When you get the availability check, and you go, oh, I don't want to work with that person. Because um, it's quite tricky. Um, because also you've got to eat. 
<laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I'm, and I like having a broad range of things. I don't like sticking to one thing. So generally, uh, a bit like Ado Annie in Oklahoma, I am the boy who can't say no. Um, so, um, yeah, I, so I will say yes. Then the script arrives. I will read it. I do, I do occasionally get scripts to read sometimes. I mean, actually, more recently, over the last couple of years, I've been thrown scripts and saying, what do you think and would you like to do it? Um, and, and those are interesting projects when that happens. I've never turned one down yet, but interesting, like I did The Entertainer and it, they, they updated The Entertainer from um, Serious Crisis? No, no, not Serious. Yeah, uh, from 1950s to... Um, to 1982, The Falklands War, and I thought that was a really interesting take on it. I'd done the entertainment before and I'd love the play, mm. but then to have it change, immediately, yeah, I'm on board, because I like the script. So I read the script, I did the first pass at the script, and immediately you get your, immediately you get your, um, your own thoughts about it, but then you go and have the meeting with the director and designer, Mm -hmm. and those things change rapidly yeah yeah because it could be you know wildly different to how you're suspecting it yeah yeah you know and we're all and we're always led i mean also i mean as you know we're we're a little bit down in the food chain it's not very often we get brought on at the very beginning of a project we mm -hmm. normally second to tier the director and designer has that initial meeting they come up with a white card and you're generally brought in at white card time but quite often i've been brought in when it's all signed sealed and delivered yeah yeah set. and have you ever been have you ever done it at the complete other end like you know you said about getting a script straight out have you ever read a script and gone no i'm not doing this this isn't the one for me hmm no no i just i just wonder a difficult one I'm, I'm sure there are people out there have uh, more artistic integrity than I do. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm a jobbing lighting designer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I like shows for a living. It's also something I'm passionate about and something that I care about. But ultimately, <clears throat> um, most things are interesting and different. And I've never turned down a show from the very small to the very large. You know, doing something upstairs in Soho. It was an interesting play. Brilliant, let's do it. Yeah. Doesn't re it's never really bothered me. The money side of it doesn't really bother I me. Mean, it bothers me because I want to make a living. But it doesn't bother me if the project is what, something I want to do. Yeah. I've never, ever got, that's not enough money, I'm not doing it. Because mm, mm. if you commit to something as well, you commit to it. Um, so, no, I've not turned anything down in that way. I've had some narrow escapes that projects haven't gone ahead and I've gone. And also I've had, I've, I've also regretted things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I think what you say about commitments really interesting there about when you, you know, when you commit to a piece regardless, if you're going to accept that fee, you're there to do your job. You've accepted you, the fee. Don't you've taken around. the queen's shilling. You've taken yeah. the queen's shilling as an old sort of army expression. Once you've taken, as they were in the Napoleonic Wars, once you've taken the queen's shilling, you've signed up. <clears throat> and I, I think, and you give it 110%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you chose think, to accept that money. That's, um, yeah, absolutely indeed. I think otherwise, I think it's, 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 it's poor. And actually, you look pants coming out the other side of it, to be honest. You look a bit up your own fundament. Which yeah. is not a good thing. You know? It's not a good look. Um, when you, you mentioned there about the, going to those initial conversations, you know, you have a read and you sort of, you kind of do build an idea in your head. I mean, what, what are some of those things in an in a initial skim read or in whatever depth before you meet a director? What are some of those things that you're looking out for in, in, a, in a piece? Well, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> clearly location, although, you know, let's, let's, take, let's do Shakespeare. Let's, let's think of Shakespeare because I... I you know, I've done 27 out of the 30 something in the canon. So I've done quite a few. Some I've done more than once and some I would never want to do again. So um, um, uh, you can have something in your, your mind. I don't mean doublet and hose and, and you know, chiffon. Uh, um, but um, you want to get out of it. Um, let's say, let's say, let's take Hamlet, 
for instance. There's a, there's a one which I've done like four times. Um, location is clearly important. So when you read through the script, I get my highlighter out and I'm and I'm marking each up and I, I mark up the scenes and I, I, I separate out all the scenes. Mm -hmm. I then I then start just writing down rough notes, maybe that's for instance Hamlet. So in the in the in the battlement scene in Hamlet, um, at the, the very the very first, you know, who, where, you know, and Hamlet's ghost is is popping in and out. And at the end of all the commotion of of um, of Hamlet's father ghosting around thee and they've got Hamlet up and and, um, and they're, all, they're all on the battlements. I can't remember the character's name. He says, look, we should go to bed because the sun is rising. It's um, the russet mantle morn. It's a bit of a wazzle, isn't it? Um, so there's an immediate clue, isn't there? Mm. You want a tickle of something on the side of the chops to, to, to denote that. It's, it's as black as Hades, or as black as Acheron, as a, another Shakespearean quote. Um, um, uh, and um, you, you, so those things come out, those jump out at you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that the director wants that. I've done some, some plays, direct Shakespeare's one, they just want it like a block of light, or there's an HMI coming from the circle front, and it's just, it's it. Mm -hmm. And... It, um, that doesn't really float my boat. Yeah, I mean, I'm a. I like to stay. I'm a. I'm a storyteller, but in with lights. That's what I like to do. Like tell stories. What I think we do as lighting designers is, is have a visual scaffolding which supports the performance. Yeah. It, it it's it also means you can manipulate. You can manipulate the. Um, you can manipulate the. Um, the audience where to look what to feel and so by some by, by, by the actor you know like you so let's say Hamlet I'm gonna scribble now kids and my drawings are really bad and I'm sure your drawings are a little better than mine but you know a stage which is like the, the RST which is but so the, so the battlements are all you see the battlements are all down here they're all facing out downstage looking at at you might decide that the light comes from stage left, but actually in the rehearsal we come to stage right. So you've got to think on your feet and they might change that because of the way blocking is. You've always got to think on your feet with, feet with that. But ultimately, the big one light source, it's on Brechtian, Eastern European type lighting, doesn't float my boat a great deal. I have done it and I've gone with it, but it doesn't really float my boat. So the storytelling is the most important thing. So if it's just a tickle of warmth before they exit, because it is literally, I think it's the last couple of lines in the, mm -hmm. in the first scene. You, so you just want a bit of warmth. Then so you get that out of the script. Then the next thing, you're in the court. So what does the court look like? Well, really, you want to contrast that. So it's, it's as black as Acheron, the beginning, because they, they want to lose the ghost. You, you don't yeah. want to see the ghost. But the next is the court, you know, it's trumpets and it's, uh, you're seeing Claudius and Gertrude. It's going to want to be something that's going to jar the audience and take you somewhere else. Now, there may not be any set, you know, yeah. it can be done with lights. It doesn't, you, that's the great thing. Sorry, it's changed something a little bit. That's the great thing about lighting. You can control. You do not necessarily need scenery to control and to suggest, I mean, Svoboda is a prime example if you look at Yose's Fobbida's work I and mean, he's a set and lighting on it but man he's a certain hero of mine he's just like amazing yeah. but he controlled and manipulated space it was all about contrast yeah. so yeah I, mean, I think I go through the scripts I I line out where I think scenes will be changing and moments within the scene but to be honest it's all in here it means not a fig until you get in the rehearsal room. Yeah, yeah. Because also you've got my monosyllabic voice reading it to me, which is as dull as dishwater. So there's no point. I, I go through it and I make my notes. But then you see the set, that gives you another visual layer, and, the, and you're talking about concept with the director and designer. To be honest with you, mainly designers, because mm. quite a lot of directors aren't in, interested in the visuals. Yeah. It's the yeah. designer that's interested in the visuals. So does it get tricky when you when you start doing things like um, obviously as you say you've done 
all of all of the genres, as it were. Um, yeah. When you start doing things like a new musical, I mean, something that you don't have a soundtrack to necessarily. How much attention do you pay to those those numbers f- when you're initially going through it? Do you read the the, the lyrics, or do you just? I, I read the lyrics, and quite often you'll have a plinky plonky piano or some synth, but it means nothing. And what's interesting, even with an old musical, until you get you sit in the room with the orchestration. Because I think lighting musicals is lighting layers. You light, with, light it in layers. It's all very, like, like a tap, I mean, I love tap dancing. My mum was a tap dancer. I love tap dancing. I can't tap dance. I used to when I was small, but I love tap dancing. And tap tacits, um, drum beats, musical, you, you start off by banging 500 lighting cues in. And then by the end of it, there's 1,500 lighting cues mm. because you've listened to the orchestrations, but you, you react it, react to the orchestrations and the band being played. I, I quite like going to a band call and listening to that mm-hmm. because then you go, man, I've really undercued this number. Or conversely, you could go, actually, I've done too many cues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your greatest asset is the video camera. The video camera I take everywhere with me. Mm-hmm. I bought a new Peli case just before lockdown with all my new things in it. And it's disappointing. It's not, it's, it's still virginal and unused. <laughs> so it's bad. Um, 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 but, um, so listening to the band and the orchestrations is really important. The music, music, there are moments, you can't explain what you do. Some people, and again, it's all subjective. We all come at it at different angles, which is a bloody good thing. But it, music, for me, I love musicals. I, 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 I particularly tap musicals. I love tap dance. So highlighting a tap, it all stops and the, and the band stop and it's tap dance and there's, you do something to change the light again. You know, you, you're, you're constantly thinking about movement and color and how that ref- integrates with the music. I was very fortunate um, in my mid twenties to reopen the Berlin Philharmonic <laughs> with Claudio Abbado um, for a piece called Prometheus. Now, bearing in mind, I don't, I don't uh, read music. Oh, I do, but it's really bad. Um, but Prometheus, if you don't, it's interesting. He wrote it for a light organ. So basically, uh, written. Uh, 1910, maybe somewhere around there. So basically, he had a light organ. So essentially, a white cotton sheet with some light bulbs. So his theory is that tone and colour go together. And he's absolutely right. You know, so, and then you add other tones on top of it, and that changes the colour because it gives you a secondary colour. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, it's, it, so I had to light the whole Berlin Philharmonie in 92 um, to and reimagine Prometheus. And it taught me a lot, as what I've seen being lucky in the right place, because I was working with a bardo who was I'm sadly dead now, but amazing maestro. I'm working with his, I had his assistant conductor conducting the lighting operator. Uh, we had a hundred in the chorus stalls and it was just an amazing piece, but um, it'd never been done on that scale because it was all done and I had to like the whole film. But it's an interesting thing that tone and color are hand in hand and when you do a, when you're doing a musical that is exactly the same buttons you know you want a button you want the audience to applaud Stephen Meir who I work with a lot is a bloody genius at getting audiences on their feet at an end of a number because he says hold it hold it hold and I'm going this is making it this is like I got whipped we're, this is like 10 minutes of just people standing like this. I know the audience all get up. Okay, fair enough. You win again, Stephen. Thank you very much. Yeah. But it, it, it's, yeah. And, and, and there's things about, I'm a great thing about giving the audience light. So you, you're taking the light from the stage into the house. That will make an audience stand because they feel motivated to stand. It's, you know, those, those, but again, it's, it's, but it's on the right point in the bang, you know, it's, yeah. it, and that's what, turns me on about musicals yeah. and it's the emotion of the music um, that then gets you as well so that adds another layer but also I mean you know the emotion of 
words. I love words. I love Shakespeare because I was sort of brought up and nursed on it with Bill in Birmingham because Bill taught me by osmosis. Shakespeare's a difficult language. You know, I don't like all Shakespeare's. There are many plays. I'd rather repeatedly poke myself in the eye than do again because they're, he was like us, jobbing lighting designers. He was a jobbing writer. He had to pay for new plays. He had to go, he had to pay for his father's debts because he nicked all his sheep. Anyway, so, um, 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 uh, so the, 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 but some of the words in Shakespeare, Mm -hmm. Some of Hamlet stuff, some of the stuff in Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, Diana's bone you bent in heaven. Oh, that's a new moon. Mm. Mm. It's, those words are, uh, those words get to me. And that also, when you're reading the play or reading the script, that gives, puts images in your head. Um, just don't, if you, what I'm trying to say is that I, like many, all of us, I hope we see in pictures, we see in pictures and that is the way I light it to start with and it's all scribbly notes and it's and then I sit on drawing and I start putting it all together yeah what is um what you do have to be careful though is that those images that you have in your head aren't fixed because you get turned over as you know quite a lot on the fit up and you can't ever spend long enough to do what you want. Hence, I think we're craftspeople, not artists, because it's was... an amalgamation of art and technology. If I was a, if I was a pure artist, <clears throat> I'd have all the time in the world, all the fixtures I wanted in the right place, at the right time, the actor standing in the right place, the house lights going out at the right time, the audience being in, the haze doing exactly what it wants to do. That is pure art. Yeah. Being in complete control. If I'm in control of a canvas as an artist or a block of marble carving the statue of David, I am an artist. I'm a craftsperson. Other people have different ideas and they're perfectly entitled to it. Personally, I think they're talking out of the tail, but that's their, that's their prerogative. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm a craftsman. Yeah, it's really interesting because uh, we've, we've had several interviews now that we hear sort of different views on how people approach that. One of the things that you sort of, um, you, you dropped a bombshell and then glossed over it. You do so much music work, be it opera, ballet, musicals, and there you've just said you're not a massive reader of music. I was, playing, you... drums, I was playing drums in a heavy metal band, if that goes out anything. No, that doesn't count. That's, <laughs> drums don't count. What are you on? No. You're a cheeky bugger. Um, I like, I like playing drums. Um, um, I have an in, inbuilt musical clock, I think. I do a lot of operas. I do. I, I listen to the music ad infinitum. Mm. Even there, that changes, but it gives. It's in here, so I know where tap tap it, or I know where the where where a thing is going to come up. I know where the button is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I say, I video everything. Yeah. And do you and do you, the video? So do you read when you approach like an opera? Then do you? Do you read the, the um, libretto or do you just listen? Do you walk around the house listening? I know, I, li I, I read the libretto. I also get things like uh, this. So it tells you all the stories of, you know, things like Mozart. Okay. okay. Right? It's a really cool thing to have. And there's loads of them out there. I mean, like, you know, Shakespeare. Hello, everybody. But look, cheat, cheat, cheat. York notes. We love them. Hello. You know, clearly all this is on the internet, but I like a book. So yeah. I then, you know, I then go and buy other shit like this, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I buy art book. I mean, Edward Hopper is a particular passion of mine. I'm a mad Edward Hopper fan. So I put out art books. Um, uh, any reference, reference is like reference and inspiration, looking at natural light, clearly, but also paintings, you know? Somebody talks to you about candlelight, I did a play. Uh, called Written on the Heart, a new play about the King James Bible in Stratford, directed by Greg Doran, uh, written by um, David, um, oh my God, uh, well anyway. Um, and um, um, it was all candlelight. Yeah. So let's go and find some candlelight. Let's, you know, let's also bug around with candle. Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, uh, it was all about puppets and shadows and stuff I did in Stratford. So 
well, I spent days bugging around listening to things, you know, looking at inspiration. Uh, books, for me, are, 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 you can look at loads on the internet, and it's very handy reference when you're on the road. But I love a book. I will go and buy a book. Mm -hmm. And we've got more art books in this house than you can shake a massive stick at. <laughs> That's my wife, who was a stage manager, is now, uh, well, she still is a stage manager, but clearly um, not working, is now doing an art history diploma. So she's like... <laughs> In the middle of that, so it's like great. So, I'm, so we're doing having great fun. Like, look at this. Look what I found. Do we see that? That's a bit rubbish. Anyway, um, so books and um, all that stuff. Anything mm. that you, that you can do. It doesn't always mean it's going to work. It doesn't always mean if you get it fixed in your head, it's going to work. Yeah. Thinking on your feet is the most important. Yeah. Responding to the emotion while you're doing it in the moment is the most important. In the background, the framework is set up. Your lighting rig is set up so that you can adapt and adjust and quickly create. Um, I hate lighting sessions, personally. They make me mad. But, you, sadly, you've got to bash something in, particularly in the musicals, you don't have enough time. But I video every tech session. Okay. And I, I sit down my video and say, these cues are all crap. This is going to change. And I've sat in note sessions, but like Greg in Stratford, I'm really sorry, the lighting's pony. I'm going to fix it tomorrow morning. There's a whole lot of stuff I'm going to do. Yeah. And taking the initiative and doing it quickly, I think, is really important and being flexible. Yeah. Because yeah. we are at the end of the food chain as regards time. Yeah. So yeah. how often have you done a gig <clears throat> when the set's behind or, the, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, a touch of a name drop here, but a certain well-known composer called Stephen Sondheim said to me, you guys are always the last to get it together. And he's right. We are always the last to get it together. Yeah. He's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. I think you're right. It's better about sort of almost holding your hands up and saying, I know that there's problems here. I'm on it. Yeah. it and, and I think that's the biggest thing with musicals in particular. I mean, operas sort of drive me a little bit bonkers because you have 4,000 lighting sessions, yeah. generally through an interpreter, and it is like the most frustrating thing in the world. Yeah. Well, really, you just want just to stand the performer there for two minutes and just light them. Literally, it would take me two minutes. But I think that's the op way the opera rolls in the big European opera houses. Yeah. Um, but I, I think being flexible and quick is a, is a bonus. But to do that, you have to have your homework done and you have to have a framework done so that you know that in this scene, it's going to be lit for this. I mean, that's the other thing is clearly the space and direction of light is terribly important. I spend most of my life now in thrust spaces. Mm -hmm. Stratford, Chichester, Sheffield, Leeds, you can basically say that's a, a thrust space. Yeah. And the direction of light is pretty important there. Because again, you're telling people subliminal lighting concepts, which is again, going back to Svoboda, about you don't have to do much to give them the impression that the sun has come up or the sun, you don't, you don't have to do very much. It's about where the angle of light comes from. Yeah. That is really important. Um, you mentioned there about doing your homework um, and all the sort of initial chat and then you go, you go, or the initial um, research and then you go to the, the chat with the director or the designer, whoever it is. Um, and they turn around to you and they say, uh, listen, Tim, yeah, we love it. This is one of my favorite Shakespeare's, but we're not actually doing it uh, as written. We're going to do it modern day. What happens then? How does that change for you? Well, I mean, does it change? Well, um, y yes, it can do, but it could be the juxtaposition that actually the lighting doesn't have to change necessarily. I mean, I'm, it's going back to earlier when I said I, I'm not a great one for um, a couple of things that really don't float my boat. Um, I love dance. Um, I'm not a massive contemporary dance fan because I don't, I can't always follow a story. I need a story. Okay. And, it, and I'm a bit of a child. So that's, I need to be told a story and I want to tell a story. So if it's a modern day production, what is modern day? I mean, I don't think I've ever done a Shakespeare in necessarily doublet and hose, I don't think. They've yeah. always been non-specific. 
if that's the correct thing. They could all be leather or they could be, you know, do you know what I mean? Because it's the costume that tell you rather than the, the, the background. Or you could have very modern clothes and an old background. Yeah. So it, I, I, I don't know, you just, certain things you will always do. Yeah. You always have a certain approach to it because that's your style. And if they suddenly turn up, I mean, I've had shows when they've gone, ah, two weeks into rehearsal, we're changing all this, and we're scrapping the set, and we're doing something else, and you go, ooh. But you, you just go with the flow. And again, I think that's about the framework that you have in the background and, and, and the work that you've done beforehand. You can adapt things. Yeah. Um, I, so the, the only thing I said to you before is, to reiterate, is that I, I, I don't like necessarily the sort of Eastern European 10K HMI from the front on. It's, 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 it's not my cup of tea because, and if somebody said that from the beginning, that's what we're doing, then I probably would question my involvement in it because it's not how I, how I like to do things. Sure, sure. You know. when, when do your ideas start translating onto interplan? I mean, the things that you've come up with, and particularly interested in you, you as we said yesterday, you, I mean, a lot of your life is spent on a rep rig now. So how do you make those sort of connections between idea and how you'll use things? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I like to do my drawings really early. Um, I like to give everybody an opportunity on the technical team to look at it. Only because I was on the other side of the fence and it used to piss me off when plans used to turn up on a Friday for an overnight rig on a Saturday. Yeah. Because I can't do a plan until I see a rehearsal and I've been oh so busy beforehand. I've done 55 shows in the last last six weeks and I've been uh, and I'm just going, well, I don't, on, on the give a monkey scale of one to ten. Maybe I don't give one. I should have had that plan two weeks ago because now I can't get you rentals and now I can't cut the colour. Now I can't, you know what I mean? Moving lights have changed that because a lot of rep rigs, they don't have to do that which can make people lazy. And I fall into that category a bit as well, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, maybe something that's come out of this nonsense that we're all sat in at the moment is that maybe we can't fill a roof full of a thousand moving lights. Maybe we do have to look at things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing that possibly comes out, out of it. But I like to get my drawings done a couple of weeks beforehand, at least. So it gives everybody to have input, the electricians have input, production management, riggers, because there's no point putting a light 25 meters in the air that will be the best shot in the universe if nobody can rig it, focus it, or maintain it. It's, it's, that's what I mean about being a crafts person. You have to do the whole, think about the whole. How is that light going to be maintained? And I know a lot of people don't want to do that, but it's important because your show wants to be, you want your show to be in the best tip top condition every time a member of, of an audience pays a pound to come and see it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I do my plans a couple, of, a couple of weeks beforehand. And then I suspect, well, I know that they will change once I start watching more and more rehearsals. I try and do as much rehearsal watching as possible, but as we all know, a sip of water but it, it's 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 more and more difficult because you're constantly on the road mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i'm back-to-back uh, -back shows are a bit of a killer but you have to be organized if you're going to do back-to-back -back shows you have to be organized and your plans have to be ready so that everybody has the information and then you can modify the plans once you start watching more and more rehearsals yeah yeah and do you do you draw do you draw those plans yourself or do you yeah. regularly engage with no. this? No, I will draw all the plans myself. I know lots of people uh, don't. Um, uh, I know my mate Howard doesn't, and um, uh, Harrison uh, he doesn't. I think he does a little one, but he doesn't. Most of his shows, he, he gets people to draw them, which I think is really cool. And I can't. I'm a control freak, but also um, I like to. Um, know where all my lights are for the scene so again thinking of pictures it's like a there like b there one there one there or it's all coming from that direction with a bit of cross light coming that way 
that's that scene lit or that. And it, of course it might change, but I've got that me a scaffolding. And I think that makes you quicker when you come to light it. Cause you know, it's channel 25, 36, 21, 42, go. And once you get in the rhythm, come on programmer, keep up. I want to, this is how I want to light a show. And it's like this, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so hence I like drawing the plans. So I, I, I've got it memorized in here before I walk into the theatre. I'm focusing. I know that channel one's going to go here, two's going to go there, three. Not that one go. Yeah, yeah. When so it comes I can to, do it quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. When it comes to rehearsals, then, like you sort of said there, I mean, do you, are you, you obviously like to be present. Do you, is there a particular point? I mean, do you sit around when they do that first bit uh, where they sit around a table? Do you, does that do anything for you, that analysis bit? Or yes. You... Um, uh, no, well, I, I will go to a read through. Mm -hmm. I don't, um, and mainly because, again, um, if I can go to a read through, I will. It's not always possible. Unlike many of us, we're busy. Um, uh, I, go to, I go to watch a read through. I go to a uh, read through because I, I also get my monosyllabic voice out, out, of, out of the way. And suddenly the play takes a life. And you go, that's a lot funnier than I thought. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm reading it going, you know, it's a bit dull. Um, uh, and so um, I will go to that. I won't, that's in the morning. And if they start doing script analysis with with the actors, sometimes I do, but not often because it's pretty boring. And I would yeah. probably then go into the production departments. Yeah. Well, there's always a kettle boiling as well in the production department, isn't there? Which is Indeed. And <laughs> you're not wrong there. And a cup of tea, a nice biscuit. That's all we're long for, really. And also, yeah, I, you know, because the actors are talking about in-depth characters, which really, do they affect me? I'm not sure that they do. do yeah. They? Yeah, words that they're speaking, but I'm not that the emotion they put into it at that point, at that point in the process, doesn't really. When it's later and I'm watching rehearsals, and they're on their feet, then it makes a lot of difference. But at the point of sitting around a table, I mean, because sometimes they can sit around a table for a week. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And I would be poking myself in the eye. Yeah, we sort of touched on on the cue and structure of what you look for and stuff. But I mean, how soon in the process does that begin to appear? Do you go to um, staggers of scenes and things or do you wait until there's a fuller oh, thing? No, it depends. I mean, I don't think there's a hard, I've got a hard and fast rule. If I, I like to go and see rehearsals as much as possible, but it's not always possible because you're always busy in theory. So I will go and watch stagger throughs of generally an act or a bunch of scenes together. Let's say they hold four or five scenes together. Now I'm free. Yeah, brilliant. And that, that will inform me because the cue structure, you know, I've got to talk about these pictures you've got for each scene, but clearly there, there's a, there's a sub, there's a sub scene amongst all that. I mean, particularly in Shakespeare, they've got a shakes, they've got a scene, it's East cheap, but there's a whole load of other stuff going on that actually is somewhere over there and there's a scene change happening and you've got to lose that so you only get that out of rehearsals yeah yeah you don't get that out of reading even to the director because they would have made that up in the rehearsal room yeah sure, sure. you know so you won't get that to watch run so i would go and try and watch as much rehearsal as possible then i would write it down where i want the cues to go then i would put it into an excel sheet I might even put it into video. Uh, I will then give it to the DSM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a time, there was a time where I would just light it on the hoof. Um, but I do less and less of that now. I tried to get at least a structure done only because it's helping people. And I think I was probably not being a particularly nice lighting designer to the poor old DSM. It was a busy show. It'd be like, you know, pouring a bucket of cold water over them at the start of the tech, you know. A lot of DSMs don't mind, in fairness, some of the more experienced ones, but the younger DSMs I've worked with, they get into a bit of a tailspin about things. And so I'd rather them cue my show properly and not and make that and make them have a nice time because we're none of us being paid a lot of money. And I think it's important that we all try and get on and have a good time. Nobody's more important than anybody else. I mean that's the biggest thing I can say to you guys out there. We need everybody. Yeah. We need everybody from the cleaner to the star. We are all in it together. 
And that is the beauty about our industry compared to other industries where people can be facing in different directions. But to make a whole holistic approach to the whole thing, but making a whole to it is, is really important. And I think everybody is creative from the chippies, the, the props guys, somebody pulling the scenery. And there's an element that wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's an element of creativity when somebody flies something in it touches on the last chord of the music you know yeah yeah so it's it's that's quite cool you know yeah. that they they've thought of that they've done that that's them being creative yeah i think this this um we've, we've not really been using these as an opportunity to talk about the um the elephant in the room of what's going on at the minute but i yeah. think this has really really shown exactly what you said i mean it's completely leveled the playing field from the, the top to the bottom everybody's in the same yeah, exactly. we're all in the same mile yeah. yeah yeah um i've got a question here it's come in yeah. um i haven't read it so bear with uh, do you think uh, that with covid a lot of rehearsal process and early creative process initial meetings design discussions etc will be pushed to go online instead of being held in person or that that stage of the process needs to be an in-person uh, conversation you no know, i think <clears throat> i'll tell you what my bugbear <clears throat> this is one whoever said that this is one Production meetings, okay? So we go to production meetings as light as ours. We roll up, we get dragged. We could be in Edinburgh doing a gig. We have to go to London because somebody's asked you to go to London. And it's very important. You get there. You've had all your conversations with your team so and design and director. You get there. They spend two hours talking about props, rehearsal, rehearsal room issues. And anything for lighting, you say, no, I've done it all. So yes, production meetings, certainly online. And in fairness... The RSC over the last three or four years have been doing that. And as I live close to Stratford, rather than me jumping on a train and going to Clapham to go and sit in a talk to a production meeting, I drive over to the RSC and they've got a meeting room and there's a because they don't want to drag all the staff. It's also saving them a ton of money. There's yeah. no train fares, you know, and all that, you know, PDs, whatever you get. Um, I've even done production meetings for other jobs when I've been out of the country. Uh, um, I think it's more difficult rehearsals, design meetings you can do, and I have done over lockdown um, some musicals that were happening this year and have gone to next year. Um, uh, I've done quite a lot of design meetings. We've looked at models and stuff. That's very easy. I think you can't, I mean, I think it's difficult to watch rehearsals. I, I've not tried it, so I don't know. But I think it would be difficult because you want to be in the room with the people. And also, you're making contact with the actors. You can talk to them because, man, they're going to kick off if they think there's too much haze and they're not lit properly. So, so being the face of the lighting is not a bad thing. And doing it on a screen is probably a bit dull. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very true. Um, one of the things that we sort of touched on yesterday was the... The diff, you know, you can you can analyse anything to the cows come home as much as you want. Uh, you can be as convinced that it's the best art you're ever going to make in your life. But if you're not realistic about uh, things like budget and um, how that impacts on it, it's just not going to work. I wonder if we could touch on that. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I mean, the thing is, going back to the craftsperson thing again, you know, time is your big enemy anyway as a lighting designer because you're, you're last in the food chain. And you generally have to focus without a set, which is always a dull thing to do, but you can do it, and I do it quite often. But quite often, your budget is set by a production manager and producer. Let's say it's a, a commercial musical that's touring. It's say it's two and a half grand a week, which is about the norm of rentals. You are not going to get what everything you require for that, and you're going to have to be realistic. So quite often, I will draw up a kit list, before I even get to the plan stage, I've had the ideas. I want to use this much. And I've looked at the drawings and I've worked out my areas and things that need to be lit and how they're going to be lit, but I'm not committed to paper. Then I submit probably in the first, well, either the latter stage of the design process or the first week of rehearsal, if it's a six week rehearsal period, the, um, a, an equipment list. Um, which is really all the bells and whistles, yeah. knowing that those bells and whistles, I will probably get 40% of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have to modify accordingly. But what I tend to do is then also speak to the rental companies and say, what do you have on the shelf? 
I've got this gig coming up. It's this amount of weeks. It's loading in here and finishes here. It's this company, you know, all the usual. And I will give them all the intel beforehand. And then they will come back to me. We've got, then they'll say, what's the budget? And you go, this. So they go, is that all? Uh, it's the usual. Um, and then they, they say to you, this is what we've got. And then you will look at, you will look at your lighting rig around that. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, I think a lot of people do it. I, I, the really, I'm sure the really, really big shows, you can get pretty much what you fancy uh, to a certain extent. But we all have to make compromises. You know, I, I think that's the norm. And, you know, the other thing is, there's no point putting up anyway if you've got 200 moving lights and you've only got 20, you've got, you're loaded at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning at a 7.30 show. Yeah, yeah. The guys aren't going to have time to do that. Yeah. So no, you need to you need to modify that as well. And that's where I think drawing a plan early and liaising with your production or your touring staff to say, I'm thinking about doing this. Do you think this is possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing worse than you, because you know, quite often people will clam up because they don't want to upset you or something. They don't want to seem to be negative, which is a good thing. But however, no is not a negative word. No can be used to be positive. I've always said that. No is not always negative. Mm -hmm. Because if you say to me, to, to, well, it, no, oh, hang on, i got a better idea. Why don't we do this? Mm -hmm. There's always something comes off it. You know, you can always work at a tangent and around things. So talking to your production staff as well, is this possible? Yeah, yeah. Also... I feel like exactly on the same page as that. I mean, um, if you're set all your parameters and stuff, um, no matter how wonderful you think it'll be, if it's your work that's got to be recreated night after night. So you do suffer and you do look uh, the fool. Yeah, and... yeah there's, no, there's no point putting a load of shit in the air if only 30% of it's ever going to get rigged. Yeah, yeah. No point, because yeah. it's going to look like a, like a mess. And also, then the producers will be on your back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because... They're going for the lighting shit. It was brilliant in the first venue. We had a week to fit it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I think you need to be realistic. Sorry, go on. No, 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 not at all. Um, a question that's come in here. How much of your uh, previous experiences like in Shakespeare and the RSC uh, influence your design for Upstart Crew? <laughs> uh, Oh, I could tell you some stories. Well, not, 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 not to be put in prosterity. Um, no, um, uh, no, 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 not really. Um, no, made me chuckle a lot because also some of the antics that go on in Upstart Crow I've seen at the RSC. I can assure you. So it's so. Um, uh, 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 no, it ha it didn't. Um, Upstart Crow was um, joyous. Made me laugh an awful lot. Good. There were some right royal Shakespeare taking the mickey which <clears throat> made me chuckle but no it didn't influence me <clears throat> it just made me smile a lot <clears throat> yeah it must be nice to see um, them taking such light of it um, after especially with a career like yours that has been so uh, you've had so I, much I was laughing from the moment I read the script that, that was actually there you go there's an example of do you, I got the script before I got an availability but before you say yes please read the script Mm -hmm. And I read the script and I was hooting with laughter because it was yeah. very funny. And then the visuals came on board that Sean did as well. And then the heart and Alice's visuals with the set, which I thought was very clever. Just these curtains that came back and forth. Um, it made me, um, made me laugh. Yeah, it was, it was um, one of the nicer experiences I've had for a very long time. I have to say it was very jolly. Oh, good. That's nice yeah, to hear. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, how involved are you with things like uh, uh, RSC productions that then come to like the Barbican, for example? Yeah, um, a lot. Um, um, although they don't always ask you to go and really like them. I mean, they, they want you to, but also they don't, they've stopped paying you as such. We used to get the fee again quite often, though, when the shows are transferring. I'm also lighting a show in Stratford, so it's a bit of a company conundrum. But yes, I mean... It's made more difficult um, now with the main house being a thrust. Um, when I first worked at the RSC, which is 1996, 
we had the pit and the barbican, pit and the main house and the barbican, and the swan, the TOP, and the main house, the RST. The RST and the barbican had the same lighting rig, is in rep lighting rig. So um, you were transferring the show down to London or vice versa and adding extras because uh, something I didn't touch on, which I'll we'll come back to, which actually ties in with this, is, is it, it's very interesting talking about the emotion of lighting a piece at the time and then doing it a year or two years later, let's say the barbecue, because you look at it again, you go, oh, good God. What <laughs> did I do? But also that is, I think, is down to your, your mental your, your emotion at approaching it at that point, if that makes sense. Because yeah. you could be going through a divorce, for instance, or something, a bad breakup, or you could be not in a good mood, and it could be completely different. So, but uh, so I slightly digress from that, so that's that. But um, yeah, so you'd have two lighting rigs the same. Now, it's a little more tricky because you're putting a thrust in a very wide open space, <clears throat> or in the West End terms, you're putting thrust into a proscenium yeah yeah so it does change the goalposts quite a lot and you end up having to do quite a lot of work relighting the shows in those venues <clears throat> um although quite often your production electrician who was generally one of the seniors in stratford would probably quite normally relight it and then you would come down maybe see a preview or something um and, but they would liaise heavily with you and you go for the drawings and you because they they everything's completely bible there i mean it's 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 you know it's books this you know a meter thick of photographs where everything's pointing and then they put in but you have to add extra stuff in so it's not straightforward transfer from pros from thrust to pros yeah it, it at times can be painful because you get a look that you're used to and then you move in to a space that is clearly biblically wide yeah. and the rst isn't anymore so yeah. it's, it's it's more difficult you said there about a, a link that you're used to the question that's just come in that sort of hits perfectly on that which is um you describe yourself as a lighting chameleon in the way that you will work on any production but do you find that you have a style or a theme which spans your work yes of course you do um yes um what that is i have no idea but i'm, I'm of course you do I'm, everybody does i mean it's interesting i mean I, I, like we all do. I, I love crosslight in particular, so I'd like it. I'd like everything to not use any front of ours if I could. Some directors won't let you do that. Some actors won't let you do that these days. Um, but anyway, um, uh, yes, you do have a style that is that is that is probably uniquely yours. Yeah. And I'll show you some photographs in a bit, and then you can have a look at those uniquely similar styles, and you might just say, "What a lazy bastard." <laughs> I don't think I don't think any of us would dare to. <laughs> Absolutely fine. <laughs> um, so one one thing then before we have a, a look at some of those um, that I just wanted to ask was what what would you describe as some of the pitfalls of each of the genres that you do? So when you jump in between them, some of the things that you sort of remind you. So I'm doing I don't know I'm doing an opera. I must remember I don't know um, maestro specials or like little things yeah. like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you've stumped me there. I don't really know. Um, I just turn up and light the show, and it happens. I do things. I don't know. I just do things. Um, I can't really put it into words. That's really bad. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> remembering the pit specials are always a good good for a game. I think it's a. a, a I think the biggest thing is like with ballet. <clears throat> it's the bloody class on stage at ten o'clock before you start anything so you have to you know stop stop hold the horses it's also time you know i do a lot of the northern ballet and i love that company with a passion they're a really lovely bunch of people and the dancers and i think it's mainly because they do ballet but it's it's very narrative mm -hmm. and which is more my street storytelling again um but it, it's the time to load in sunday and your premieres on the friday or the thursday yeah. i eventually got them to do a couple of previews <laughs> they went previews i said why do why do we have to open can't we open on saturday can we not just do right i like, can do notes in the morning we can make it better and also you could do a run through with cast two so that's that was i got them to change that so that was that was a that was a massive win um um and opera again is coming in out of the bloody rep 
with yeah. opera is a is a killer. I mean, because you you lose all momentum. So you get going and it's ah, yeah, this is really good. We're doing it. We're doing it. And then at three o'clock, sorry, we've got to get this set out and we're doing, you know, Figaro. <laughs> and then that all comes down and the lighting rig get, I mean, Oslo, they were moving the lighting rig as well. I went, you're moving the lighting rig. I'm like, good Lord. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, Th those things are a killer and they, they're a bugbear, but you, you sort of get used to it. I, I think initially, you you get the cold sweats about it because you go but then after a day of doing it you go oh yeah of course i forgot it's yeah. i've got to come out of the rep yeah i've got two days off now and i'm sat in the most expensive town in the universe and i can't even afford a beer yeah. so, um, that's yeah. just like sad times <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think that's um that's exactly what i meant because i think there's so much of uh, what we're trying to achieve in these discussions is that so much of what people do is just instinct now and it's, it's finding a way to describe you know those things that we just go oh yeah you just need to remember xyz but if, if you you know if you're segwaying into this new there there are new things to you yeah man and, and, and it's still well, i don't know maybe i'm childlike i treat everything like a first day at school so i'm always a bit nervous about stuff um and um so I'm always trading on eggshells the first day, unless I really know the crew and not, you know, and I'm, you know, you miss well bastard, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the first couple of days of any new, particularly if you walk into a venue for the first time, mm -hmm. don't forget, I mean, <clears throat> as a lighting designer, you're one of the few people in all the technical departments that cross into pretty much every other department, wigs, stage automation props yeah. scenery you cross every boundary so you have to communicate with everybody that's a really good thing i think half the time as a line design you are a production manager because you're heading off problems why is that rig like that that's going to be the way why don't you just move it oh right that's a good idea and also again that whole team thing what i said to you before um it's terribly interesting Trundling, I've been fortunate enough to trundle around the world an awful lot and work in some really cool places with some really cool people and some really strange places and really strange people. But um, everybody, even though like I'm sat in a bar in downtown Ikebukuru in Tokyo and all the lampies are the same. They have the same gripes. They have the same issues. I go to Russia, it's the same gripes, it's the same issues, France, the same. Yeah. It's terribly interesting as a, as a world of light, as a layer of lighting, in particular, because we cross, and including the technical department of the lighting team, cross all those other boundaries, and they all have the same gripes. And it, whatever language, through an interpreter or through broken English, because I barely speak English, being Welsh, um, um, uh, it's uh yeah it's really interesting so as you go into a venue for the first time you have to immediately grab people and bring them with you yeah yeah and the biggest thing i can say to any of you guys out there the two words that your mum would give you a kick in the back of the head if you didn't say it is please and thank you i've seen it with other people not saying directors designers light designers not saying please and thank you at the end of the evening going to the stage crew thanks guys they look massively confused but the next morning when it oh, i need that bit of setting i need that. oh yeah no problem yeah yeah it's about inclusion and bringing people with you and strangely as i get older i'm finding that more fascinating than actually lighting the show the show is a show is interesting sideshow to what i like is i like people and actually bringing them on board and making them feel that it's part of your they're part of that whole thing so that if you do fall in the shit which we do on many occasions they'll go no problem we'll help you yeah. if you're a miserable so-and-so they're going to go on a tea break yeah absolutely it's common decency because i mean we're all humans at the end of the day do you know what i mean i know as i said to you before probably 95 percent of people work in our industry in the various departments all want to be creative and they all want to be there. They want to be there for whatever reason, but generally they want to be creative. Yeah. 
So yeah. bringing, bringing them on board is a great thing because you also, they come up with some really good ideas. I never thought of that. Right, well, I'll do that. Yeah. Who cares? You know? Absolutely. Who yeah. Cares? I wonder then if this is, um, I'm just sort of wary of time slightly. But Sorry, I, I do bang on a bit. I did say that. No, you're not bang on at all. Um, I wonder if this is a good time to talk through some of your photos. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll share screen. Stand by, please. So uh, here we go. Uh, so this is, um, got, you did get a plan um, for King Kong. Um, this is what I did at the Food Guard a couple of years back. Uh, brilliant play, written in the 1950s uh, about the first black heavyweight champion. Um, written by about 20 people. So trying to get it done again was a real nightmare. Um, brilliant music, uh, jazz music. Um, and uh, it ran in London in the 60s for a couple of years and then went to Broadway and ran forever. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, I, and we revived it, partly written by Orlando Bloom's father, bizarrely. So uh, I'm just going to run through some photographs. So there's one. There's, the food guard is quite a small space. Sadly, under all this nonsense, they just basically closed. But it's about boxing boxing match boxing a fighter and they and in a in um in and 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 set in a club which in south africa is called shabines they were sort of and they were sort of like 1930s gangsters because in the 50s they watched a lot of 19 in the townships watched a lot of 1930s gangster mm -hmm. movies yeah on that i can't remember if it was the, the third or the fourth foot but the, you start seeing some of the set acts there um how much yeah. How much of that, when you read a script, is stuff that you suggest versus uh, versus stuff that the, the well, designer? Well, that's interesting. Um, no, the designer, the designer will clearly want things like pracs and stuff, but I will suggest how they they, they are. <laughs> like they were meant, they were used for the boxing match. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, they came on yeah. for the boxing match, but I wanted tongue clear. We with an LED, and then we just put golf balls, and didn't want them very bright. Um, and I quite like the contrast of the tungsten. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And again, you can see the Shabine. The set was all sort of tin, if that makes sense. Yeah, nice. A lot uh, of texture. Yeah, it was really good. It was a good shade of lights. Really good cast. Really great dancers. It's lovely. She, yeah, she was American. Uh, and he was an amazing guy. He, was a, he looked like Cassius Clay. Sadly, he died last year. A very young man had a heart attack. Very sad in his thirties. Very sad. Um, so um, yeah, that's that. Uh, where else can I go? Uh, what's this one? Uh, uh, some random ballet stuff. Um, so uh, this is Streetcar Named Desire, which I did at Scottish Ballet, which has been all around the world and won like awards after awards. It's a really cool piece. A lot of backstory, the reason why Blanche. I mean, I quite like this. Quite often, the ballets that I do have directors as well as choreographers, and they give trying to give the give the dancers some character, which I think is really good, and some narrative, which I think is very cool. Um, so, um, uh, and then I'll just find some more of this. There's another one of her. She was like a moth dancing around the flames. We had lots of light bulbs that flew in and out, controlled off the lighting desk. It was quite fun actually. Matt the was chief is now technical director did did that um uh the, the the hotel sign with boxes actually i don't have a photograph of it but they formed the background of the sort of um southern mansion where blanche came from they all collapsed and then they built things out of them like the hotel um and you can see all the light bulbs and they're glory and they all have little dmx motors and they could fly in and out That's so we could create shapes yeah um which is really quite cool um, boxes, is it? Yeah. Pardon? That's the boxes there. Yeah, but they basically form the set. Um, and then I did one not so long back, Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which is a very difficult thing to do as a ballet, but I thought it was pretty good. Uh, and again, Northern Ballet. And they strive to do stuff like this, which I think is rather nice. Um, uh, you know, I think it's actually rather, rather good um, way of... Uh, you know the boys playing it's all very crisp and clean isn't it it's nice. yeah I, yeah I, 
I don't know. I like, I, I mean, again, story, I'm a storyteller. I like to tell stories. So even with dancers, I like to see their faces. I like to see their emotion. And I think that's, that's quite, um, quite a useful thing. Uh, and then I did uh, their Cinderella, again, um, at Northern Ballet. Um, this is uh, uh, Anthony and Cleopatra that I did for them. Again, a new piece. Uh, a bit more Anthony and Cleo. Um, and then things like The Great Gatsby, mm. which has been, again, all around the world. Um, she's a beautiful dancer. She's left them now. Martha, amazing dancer. She's no left. Oh, she's another really good dancer. So that's that. That's the ballet world. Uh, what's this one? Uh, oh, right. So um, you did have a couple of plans, um, uh, well, which was the rep of Christmas Carol. Um, so this is Chris, the shots of Christmas Carol. So in a rep, I, it was a two-show rep for Christmas. I designed both of them, which is quite fortunate. But anyway, so this is Christmas Carol. Um, so we had to produce the ghosts. So we did a lot of bugging around getting a face on some, on some steam. So basically a little pond vaporizer in a thing and then we projected onto that, which I thought was quite cool. Now, mm. the, interestingly, you can see the windows in the background. Most people have got, oh, an LED box, put a box in. No, we use birdies and just put them in different angles like candles. So they, they, they weren't all lit evenly. As you can see the top corner, they're sort of shadowed like it's rather than it being a light box, which I think was looked more appropriate for the set. I do like a single shadow if I can get away with it. And it's all inevitably, it's difficult in a thrust. In particular, if you look at the corners here, everybody's cross-lit with well, a ghost isn't, she's in a little follow spot, but everybody's cross-lit to see their faces. But the big issue always in these places is, is the light collection point. You've got multiple sources to come around the proceed, around the thrust. They all have the light has to go somewhere, inevitably ends up in the corners of the pros. So you're always asking the designer to either darken it down or or like Stephen put a load of set there, which is terribly fortunate. Um, this is want, and uh, we had a bunch of old VL5 arcs, because we never had left, they just moved around like, like a bit like <coughs> Steven Spielberg and the Goonies. But, um, uh, <coughs> and you can see him back there, and then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a terrible cough, and it's not the C word. Um, <coughs> uh, Again, single shadow sources. And then these are fo models of the photo uh, photograph models. Uh, photograph of the model. Yeah, yeah. You can see it's very similar to what we ended up with. And then uh, uh, is a cue sheet of, you know. Yeah. yeah. I just random, just on an Excel file of that. So that's that. Uh, where do we, so, uh, oh, I didn't show you 12 night. So in that rep, with um, in that rep with this with Christmas Carol was Twelfth Night, very different look, very different um, set in again, but set in Edward, uh, set in Victorian uh, England. Mm -hmm. um, that's the great thing about rep, isn't it? I mean, they, they couldn't be more different. Yeah. That, that's the reason I thought I'd show you them. So they're completely wildly bonkers, yeah. um, you know, different, completely different look. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, curtains. Um, so curtains is a one day in and on show. So you've seen the lighting rig. It's not a particularly big lighting rig. Um, uh, and again, it's a prime example of, I've only got one pound fifty, and we'd like we'd like twenty five pence change out of the whole event. So, <clears throat> yeah. the opening number. Oops, sorry. Um, I think the thing that was really interesting about this, in terms of the plan, was sort of uh, something I asked you yesterday. But I mean, it looks so tungsten side light that sort of lovely warm skin tone, and yet so much of it is LED. LED. <clears throat> but the problem is, again, it's going, it's, there's no point sticking a ton of tungsten. Uh, I love tungsten, but the LED emulation is getting so much better. And I was down at ETC the other day looking at some new stuff, and I think they, they're really on top of it. Um, um, you can't have it. You've got, you don't want to be dragging in 148 way of AVOs. Yeah. 
You want to be taking it in. You want to be putting a boom, a couple of power and data to each boom. Yeah. Yeah. As you can see on that drawing, if you've still got that drawing floating around, it's just basically a boom behind legs and there's not much on them, yeah. but they do a lot of, they do, they pretty much like the show. Yeah, absolutely. I think this, we're doing a whole session on this in, in the future about sort of considerate touring. I mean, and, and what, um, well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? If people like Northern Ballet now have all moving, only moving lights on the overheads because they don't want to get a tour scope out because of different tour scope regulations. Yeah. It's because it's painful, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so moving lights, if you can get away with it. Um, this is Mary Wilder in Stratford. This is, you know, this is a, a concept change. You see the costumes by Les Brotherston, I think are wonderful. Uh, you can see the collection point of light, which is a bit dull. Um, all this, all this, uh, all lit up. Uh, it was polycarb, but painted brilliantly by the painters and Caroline, my senior, on it did an amazing job of wiring all this. They changed colour, um, uh, as you can see. Um, quite camp. Uh, <laughs> Falstaff is quite camp. Um, the costumes I love, like you know, the sort of mixture of all sorts of stuff. But that's what I mean about you know, do you do you change the lighting? I mean, the lighting was dictated to that. Les and I talked about having having the what would have been wattle and door light up. Um, yeah. But I mean, the costumes. I mean, look at that. It's awesome, isn't it? And Doctor Doctor Caius, he's French, um, <laughs> hence <laughs> his first entrance <laughs> to the stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely tells the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we even got, we even got Falstaff catching his knackers on a on a wheelie bin. Um, That's fantastic. So it's just see what I mean. It it, it doesn't. Yes, it, it's got elements of you know you've got a rough and you've got all that. But, but does the lighting need to? Does the lighting? I couldn't do. You know, you could conversely say that it could just be done in one HMI from the front or something. You know what I mean? It could just be done in. It's not me. I can't do it. Yeah. It would drive me. It would drive me crackers. Um, uh, so one yes. of the things that I was going to do with you after uh, maybe after we do this musical one is um, mm-hmm. I've got five sort of quick fire questions to. Sort yeah, of, of course. Questions. So I'm going to bang through a couple of musicals. That's Sing the Rain. She's going to be out next year again. Um, this is um, 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 me and my girl did Unchitch to Guys and Dolls. You can see the contrast and things. This is Into the Woods, Opera North and um, West Yorkshire Playhouse. Uh, go on, guess everybody, West Side Story. Um, uh, in Cape Town. Well, that's good, look at that. Huh? They do look like they're sort of farting on that, I'm afraid. But, um, <laughs> They're fantastic, aren't they? I think that's the end of that. Yes. Um, I just do. You want to see some opera? Because you've had um, you've had some plan. So this the, the, the opera plan I gave from Nor- from Norway from Oslo Opera. It was three operas, Tritico, uh, and very three very different settings. This one's this one's. Uh, Gianni Skiki, which were which is set in the sixties, um, and we're obviously showing a porn movie as well. Um, and this one is Tabaro, which was uh, set in the turn of the nineteen hundreds. With a barge coming up. This one is uh, Soir Angelica, which was set in a nineteen fifties convent, which is more like a prison. Wow. Back to Skiki. Fantastic. A lot of nuns. It's almost the sound of music, but not quite. And then <laughs> one other thing. Where are we? Um, uh, operas. So again, look, just looking at contrast. So this is Bohem at Welsh National Opera. That is um, Fidelio. Again, very conceptual at ENO. That is Force of Destiny. Well, I got the great, the great review of Tim Mitchell's uh, mind grade inducing lighting, which I was quite proud of. Um, I think that was in the Times because uh, I pointed a 4K HMI. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, uh, and that's the set. Back to that. This is more more Bohem. Uh, that is Fidelio again. 
bit more for Dalio. That whole set fell over. Um, on, on purpose? Or? Yeah, fortunately, yeah, because it filled the collie. <laughs> it filled the front of the collie from left to right and top to bottom. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> Iolanthe, which is a complete contrast again. You know, I'm doing a couple, couple more next year there. Uh, uh, that's... Uh, Marinsky, uh, that was a woman without shadow, which is clearly quite tricky to do without shadow. Uh, so that's that. And then um, uh, some other play stuff. So Exorcist, a lot of video, like mapping on the walls, changing stuff all the time. So you've got to be careful you're not wiping all that. And you're working more and more with video now. Uh, mm. This is Taken at Midnight, which is a brilliant brilliant play probably my favorite play i've done in the last 10 years um about that uh, um that was by the same writer called uh, at first light a lot of rain in the minerva so again a small space another small space that's the swan um a bit more the swan that was at birmingham Mulbrett when they closed a play called forests <coughs> with which is in catalonian english and was bits of shakespeare so it was an interesting piece mm. Um, lovely yeah. colors here. I don't. Some lovely colors. Yeah, I, yeah. I like color. I, I. Bizarrely, you go through phases again of using stuff and not using stuff, and um, the Swan again. Um, that's it. Right. Sorry, Rory. You want to say something? No, not at all. I was just going to say, um, and thank you for that. I was just going to say that we're going to have to sort of start wrapping up. Okay. Um, but um, I'm doing a little thing that's five sort of quick fire questions yeah. um, before you go. Um, so, what is your favorite part of the design process? Um, previews. Oh, brilliant. Um, your favorite post tech drink? Ha, good Lord, uh, everyone. <laughs> I, I, I'm never, never shy of having a, having a, a Swifty after. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I, so to, 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 uh, I was brought up in an era where everybody drank and I was the only one who didn't. Mm -hmm. um, people were pissed quite often and would be on the board pissed or, uh, you know, would go, go to the club for 10 lagers, you know. And I've worked in opera companies where they, they, they worked the scene change out on the how many pint scene changes. It. And I never counted as that. After work, brilliant. I don't have a problem, but I... I uh, I won't touch it even in previews. Why are you having a drink in a preview before the show? No. Yeah. I think yeah. it's bad form. And if one of my crew are drinking, I can't then jump on them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a slippery slope as well, isn't it? It's bad. Yeah. But after, after school, that's okay. Um, now this sort of is a, a, a bit of a geeky one. An open preset on stage or house tabs? <laughs> no idea. Whatever's appropriate. Bro, um, a piece of advice that you wish someone had given you? Um, hang on to your early directorial contacts as much as possible. Because mm. you never know where they might go. Yeah. And finally, if you had to write an autobiography right now, what would you call it? <laughs> um, in the shit. <laughs> Ah, fantastic. I love, I, it sounds like a grip and read. I, I, look to <laughs> I, I, I think I think I think you might put it burn it by page end of page one, I think might be the Not at all. <laughs> um, listen, Tim, thank you so much for your time. That's um no that's at the end. I really, really appreciate you taking no, the time. And guys, if you have any this is to the to the house, but if if, if you if you have any questions or you want anything, look. It's a, it's a dull old world, as we all know at the moment, and I'm very happy to help advise or, you know, if you need anything, please um, just drop me an email, you know, 